Good morning. The person who rows the boat generally doesn't have time to rock it. Let's turn to 335. We're going to sing the first and last verse, He Hideth My Soul. Savior is Jesus my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, where rivers of pleasure I see. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. <clears throat> When clothed in his brightness, transported, I'll rise to meet him in clouds of the sky. His perfect salvation, his wonderful love, I'll shout with a millions on high. He hideth my soul, in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. 370, day by day, when you bury the hatchet, don't mark the grave. <laughs> Day by day, and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here. Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I've no cause for worry or for fear. He whose heart is kind beyond all measure Gives unto each day what he seems best Lovingly is part of plain and pleasure Mingling toil with peace and rest Every day the Lord himself is near me with a special mercy for each hour. All my cares he fain would bear and cheer me. He whose name is Counselor and Power. The protection of his child and treasure is a charge that on himself he laid. As your days, your strength shall be in measure. This the pledge to me he made. Help me then 
even in every tribulation. So to trust your promises, O oh Lord, that I lose, not face sweet consolation, offered me within your holy word. Help me, Lord, when toil and trouble meeting, Heir to take as from a father's hand. One by one the days, the moments fleeting, till I reach the promised land. 362. Jesus is walking with me. Folks with a lot of brass are seldom polished. I've been through the valley, I've been through the fire, I've walked through deep waters, I've bowed in the mire. I've fought in the battle with courage all gone. But this is the reason I'll always go on. Jesus is with me, my shepherd and guide. All that I need, he is there to provide. That makes the difference, this friend by my side. Jesus is walking with me. I've known disappointment, I've suffered some loss. I felt on my shoulders the weight of a cross. I've wept in the darkness and wished for the light. But somehow his presence gave songs in the night. Jesus is with me, my Savior and God. All that I need, he is there to provide. That makes the difference, this friend by my side. Jesus is walking with me. I've laughed on the mountain, I've savored success. Rejoiced in my blessings, in more than in less. I've tasted the good life, praising His name. But sunshine or shadow, it's always the same. Jesus is with me, my shepherd and guide. All that I need, He is there to provide. That makes the difference, this friend by my side. Jesus is walking with me. Thank you. Happy Sabbath, everybody. It's good to be here. It's always good to be here. I'm going to take a few minutes this morning to open up a subject that I haven't heard talked about in 30 years. And it's a subject that Denny Williams, where is Denny? He's, he's teaching the lesson day. Where is that Denny? Okay, tell Denny, he's the one that got me to do this. <laughs> one time. It was me and Ray and Denny, I don't remember, maybe Stacy. We, we were just talking, talking stuff, and um, just kind of looking at what was going on around us, and I made the comment that 
the Lord is going to have to get the Egypt out of us before he can take us into the heavenly Canaan. And then he started thinking about that, and he says, you really need to talk about that thought. <clears throat> I said, okay, well, a Sabbath School special feature short, so we're just barely going to hit it today, but I want to talk to you a little bit about something that uh, I find quite fascinating. Fascinating to study. There's always some gem to overturn in God's Word. And it helps us for today. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11. Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Them was the children of Israel. All these things were written for us so we would know what to try to avoid. And it's quite interesting to take a look at the comparison of the children of Israel and the Advent movement. There is a lot of similarities, quite a lot of similarities. To start off with, and I'm going to start writing some of these on the board, and I hope uh, maybe, maybe I can take this one with me, Kenny. Um, First off, the movements were called out of Egypt, spiritual Egypt, out of Babylon. They're called out of Babylon. They're called to be separate. They are called to be a people that is showing the whole world the right connection to the Lord. <clears throat> Both, both uh, groups called out of Babylon. Now, when the children of Israel left Egypt and they're headed on their way to the Promised Land, what great events took place? Yes, that's an excellent one. What happens before they get to the Red Sea? They had to kill a lamb and the, blood over the, the Passover happens. What led up to the Passover? The plagues. Did I spell that right? What's going to happen before the Advent people get home? There's still going to be, a, there's a similarity here. The children of Israel were given something quite special. His name was Moses. Moses is a what? He's a type of Christ, yes. He's a prophet. Oh my goodness. This movement, Israel, was given a prophet. Is there any similarities? What did Moses do to help the children of Israel get through to the promised land? Oh, there's a lot of answers here. There's one in particular I'm after. What did Moses do to help the people remember? Remember what? Maybe the Exodus. Maybe the law. The one thing that he did is he communed with the Lord on a daily basis. Yes. That communion led to him doing something with a pen. What did Moses do? He wrote a bunch of books. And those books were there to help the people get through. We talk about another leader over here on this side. Um that wrote a whole lot of stuff for us to help us get through. Amen. 
what is one of the uh, what is one of the first things that this Children of Israel movement comes to after the Exodus? Big event. I'm looking for a big event here. They go through the Red Sea and then Moses takes them where? The wilderness. The wilderness of Sinai. And what happens at Sinai? Ten Commandments. Hmm. Was there an emphasis of law in the Advent movement? Oh, yeah. Is there something wrong with that? Not necessarily. No. No, no, no. There's nothing wrong with law. God's universe is governed by law. And we must abide by that law if we're going to live in his universe. But I'll still let you say not necessarily. It's okay. Because we mess things up, don't we? Okay. <clears throat> after the law, after the law, there's another, another very important thing that was given to the children of Israel. It's in the writings of Moses, and it was to help them live above everything on earth. Another hint, it has to do with, Is this a trick question? no, <laughs> and another thing, it has to do with health. Oh my, what, ha what did, did, the, did the folks back in Moses' time, they got some health reform, didn't they? And it comes across as well. We've got our health reform. <clears throat> okay, now I got three minutes. Now we got we got to really rock and roll here, okay? <laughs> <clears throat> Moses led the children of Israel to the borders of Kadesh Barnea. What is that? The entrance to the promised land. And the very first time they came to the borders in the promised land, what happened? They sent spies. They sent spies. But they didn't go in. And they didn't go in. Hmm. They had a chance to enter the promised land on time in God's will. And what happened? They didn't, they didn't trust him. They didn't go in. Hmm. Okay, do we have a parallel situation in the Advent movement? 1888. And what happens in 1888? Amen. Amen. And, and we still didn't get it. And we still weren't able to go in. And a little bit later, some of the writings that we have privilege to say something that goes like, because of insubordination and unbelief, we, we were unable to accept this beautiful message of righteousness by faith. And we will now have to tarry in this world for many more years until Jesus comes. So both movements, both movements retreat and go back to where? Children of Israel, yeah, the wilderness. We're living in a wilderness, aren't we? Aren't we? Aren't we in a wilderness of sin? We're in it, waiting. All right. Because of time, I'm going to hit one more. Don't cut it short, brother. <clears throat> this is going to segue right into the lesson. Okay. Well, still, then, Denny, you've got some good stuff coming. I'll, I'll try to, 
I'll try to wrap still with one more good point here. We're both taught the Sabbath. We're tested by the loyalty of the Sabbath. We're both taught the law, health reform. We both have offshoots, fanatics, and fringe movements. There is one right way, my friends. And now we're being led through the wilderness. And if we're being led through the wilderness, that implies, if it is not 100% clear, that there has been a huge a huge delay in entering the promised land there's been a huge delay we threw out one answer as to possibly why but now that we did not make it in when we were taken to the borders of the promised land the first time there's something else that is going to happen to wrap it all up and send Jesus to catch his faithful. What is that something that will cause the delay to end? The gospel has to be preached to all the nations, and then the end will come, so my Bible tells me. A shaking. A shaking. These are both correct answers. I'm just listening and thinking about it and matching it up to my answer. Level, yes, ma'am. Personal level, uh, we're told that uh, we will be reflecting the image of Jesus fully. Yes, ma'am. Okay, yes. So there is a polarization taking place to separate God's children. They should shine more brighter than those who are not choosing. There is a polarization. The polarization is caused by the shaking and caused by the gospel. Are you going to accept it or not, right? <clears throat> All right, tie that in with what Moses says. Deuteronomy. 9, Deuteronomy 9 and verse 5. Hmm. I'm going to back it up to 4. We're listening to Moses. He is telling the children of Israel. He's just pleading with them. He knows he's about to go to sleep. He's telling them, do not think in your heart after the Lord your God has cast them out before you, saying, Because of my righteousness, the Lord has brought me in to possess this land. But it is because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is driving them out from before you. He has to say it again, number five, It is not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart that you go in to possess the land but because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord your God drives them out from before you, that he may fulfill the word which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Therefore understand that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land to, be, to possess because you are righteous, for you are a stiff-necked people. <laughs> he just hammered it home. And can be very stubborn. Hmm. <laughs> Makes me think, to wrap up the thoughts here, that one other similarity there may be. And, well, there's many. Oh, this study is great. This study is so, there's so many interesting points. There was a mixed multitude that came out of Egypt with them. The mixed multitude runs with us today. We, we are so easily distracted and so easily retreat towards Egypt. We so easily complain of how good uh, we don't have it, and yet we're incredibly blessed. 
because of the wickedness of the nations. Uh, Ellen White writes something that goes along the lines of um, the Lord has an account with the nations and when the cup is full he will come there is a time coming when the maturity the fruit has ripened fully one to one side and one to the other and it is that time when Jesus will come and he is allowing the delay because he's trying to get everybody on board the ship so my friends let him get the Egypt out of your hearts my friends let Jesus come in that you are a shining light to help someone else get out of Egypt because time is closing and Jesus is coming soon and we all want to go home <laughs> I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God I've been washed in the fountain cleansed by his blood Joint heirs with Jesus as we travel this sod. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. Let us take our hymnals. Turn to 563. 563 All that thrills my soul We're going to sing all four verses can cheer the heart like Jesus by his presence all divine true and tender pure and precious oh how blessed to call him mine all that thrills my soul is Jesus he is more than life to me And the fairest of ten thousand In my blessed Lord I see Love of Christ so freely given Grace of God beyond degree, mercy higher than the heaven, deeper than the deepest sea. All that thrills my soul is Jesus. He is more than life to me and the fairest of ten thousand in my blessed Lord I see every need is and supplying every good in him I see on his strength divine relying he is all in all to me all that thrills my soul is Jesus he is more than life to me and the fair 
fairest of ten thousand. In my blessed Lord I see by the crystal flowing river with the ransomed I will sing and forever and forever praise and glorify the King all that thrills my soul is Jesus he is more than life to me and the fairest of ten thousand in my blessed Lord I see before we pray this morning I'm curious to know how many of you have something that you are really thankful for this morning? I'm glad to see everybody's hand up because really, no matter how difficult your life may have been this last week, there is still something to be very thankful for. If you wish to kneel as we pray, let's pray to our Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, it is with much gratitude that we come to you this morning. We are thankful for the many blessings that you have given to us during this past week, our food, our shelter, and the opportunity to worship together this morning. Your love and care for us when we are stressed or worried or brokenhearted are gifts that are valuable to each one of us. You have given us the hope of a soon coming Savior and the resurrection morning. Because you have given us so much, help us then to share with others your love, your hope, and material things as well. Bless the family gatherings that will be happening during this coming week. May be the, they be the means of drawing us closer to one another and most importantly, closer to you. We ask your blessing on Pastor Tony as he speaks to us this morning. Give us open hearts that, so that we may incorporate the words that you have given to him into our own lives. Accept our gratitude and our love this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. There were two tr truck drivers sharing one truck. They were uh, riding together, and they were discussing the load that they were getting ready to load up and to deliver. And the one driver said to the other, hey, bud, we've got these turkeys we need to deliver to Denver. Now, there's two ways that we could do this. Number one, we can do it the traditional way, and that is loading them up already frozen and taking them to Denver, hauling them across the highways and byways and taking them to Denver. However, there's another way we could do it. We wouldn't even have to bother about the uh, processing plants. Just open the doors and let them fly. <laughs> Finally, the one driver looked at the other and you know, he says, really, bud, have I ever told you thank you? Thank you for being my partner, my driving partner for all these years. And now the, it is the Thanksgiving season. There are little things to be thankful for. And maybe some things that we haven't even thought about before. Turn to your partner, turn to your friend and think of something that you can be thankful for and tell them that while the piano ensemble gets ready to pray. And I'll tell you, I'll give you one thankful thing. I, I am right up front and I'm thankful for these ladies. They go through an awful lot on Wednesday nights with me. <laughs> and I appreciate so much the opportunity of 
of sharing the talents with them and being able to play for the glory of God. This morning they're going to play for the beauty of the earth. That takes some teamwork, doesn't it, to do that all together. Thank you for that music and for your ministry there. You know, many of those pianists or pianists here during the week, each Sabbath we usually have one or more that uh, serve us, and we have pianists that are in our Sabbath school programs and other places. And, you know, I'm very grateful for all the ministries that are in this church and for our musicians who share their talents with us. And so thank you for that. Uh, my notes are, is this on? My notes are available for, uh, for you to follow along if you'd like. Springtownchurch.org, you can go online and there's a link there to today's date if you wanted to see and follow along on version. I want to tell you a story that happened to me when I was about four years old. And uh, we were living uh, at my grandparents' farm 
in Oklahoma, western Oklahoma, and my parents had a mobile home that was uh, right there on the, on the home place. My grandparents' house was right there just across the yard, and, and aunt and uncle was uh, also nearby, and it was a lot of fun to be close together with family. And I can remember, I was, I was four, and my sisters were about three years old, and uh, one time, Dad was at work, and Mom went over to Grandma's house to, to talk to her about something, to get something. I don't know what it was. But she left my sister and I there at the house. It was only going to be gone for a few minutes. And while she was gone, we decided to go exploring. And we found our way into the bathroom there in the hallway. And uh, I had watched Dad. He would shave every morning, and he would fill the sink up with water and put a shaving uh, can in there to warm it up. And I had seen him fill the sink up with water. And I thought, I'd like to try that. And so while Mom was over at Grandma's house, I turned on the faucet and got the water going. And my sister Tammy, she hopped up on the cabinet there, and she was there to watch the, the process. And, and she found the other knob, and we started turning knobs, and the water was going. And then we discovered, if you pulled up on this little tab, that it plugged the sink. Well, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to see the sink fill up. And so uh, the, both faucets were on, and we plugged the sink, and it began to fill. And this was great. This is exactly what I wanted to see, except that it kept filling. And it kept coming up, and it kept coming up, and I realized that in just a few moments I was going to have a problem because it's going to come across the top of the sink. And so I reached up and I started turning knobs. Now, here's the problem. I didn't realize how the knobs really worked. I mean, I knew you twisted them to get them going, you twist them to turn it off. But as I'm turning one knob, my sister's turning the other knob, we could never stop the flow of the water. Well. I didn't think to hit the little plunger and drain the sink. All I know is all of a sudden we had a waterfall down the front of the sink. Well, at that point, I knew we had a problem on our hands. And rather than trying to fix it anymore, I figured I got to go get mom. So I abandoned the sink while it's still flowing and water running over. I go running out of the mobile home across the yard yelling, Mom! Mom! Well, she was coming from Grandma's house. And she could see my eyes are big and I'm frantic and something must be really wrong. And I don't know if I even explained to her what it was. I just ran back to the house and she followed. And here is this waterfall coming out of the sink and on the floor. Now it's flooded the bathroom. It's going underneath the walls. It's dripping underneath the mobile home. And we had quite a mess on our hands. Of course, all she had to do was turn the two knobs the correct direction, push the little plunger, and everything was okay, but there was quite a mess. And I just remember that, that feeling of this overflowing water and, oh no, what am I going to do now? Well, that's kind of in a negative sense. It was a problem when that overflowed in my life. But I want to talk to you in a positive sense when something overflows in our hearts. And we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit today. And this is a good thing when the Holy Spirit comes and overfills and floods out of our lives. Matthew chapter 25 is the parables that we're going to look at today. We're continuing where we left off last week. Last week we had looked at the, um, at the need for oil in our lamps to have our, uh, our lights shining. And today we're going to take on two more parables. These parables that Jesus is giving to us is in the context of his second coming. And he often talks about the kingdom of heaven is like, or when the Son of Man comes, it will be like this. And you'll see those phrases again today. It's important to understand that Jesus teaches that there are conditions that we must meet to be accepted into God's kingdom. The tension is found in the fact that we don't have the resources in ourselves to meet these conditions. But the good news is that God will give us the resources if we ask. So last week we looked at the need of the oil of the Holy Spirit for our light to shine. And today we take on another, or these, two, these two last parables in Matthew 25. In Matthew 25 and starting with verse 14. Jesus goes on to say, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man 
traveling to a far country, who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability, and immediately he went on a journey. Now, now pause there for a moment, because I want to start asking some questions about these parables to understand what, what is it that we're being taught. So just in those first two verses, let's ask some questions about this. And, and for example, um, what, what's some of the questions? Well, here's, here's one of them. Who owns the resources that are given? The master owns it, correct? It, it was his goods, is what it says, given to them, the servants. And where the resources come from? It came from his bank account, didn't it? Not theirs. It comes from, their, uh, from his bank account. He gives them these resources. Now, I, I read in Andrew's study Bible, the Bible commentaries here about this, the amount of a one talent was equal to about 6,000 days wages. 6,000 days wages. So let's say you work six days a week. Um, it's about 20 plus years of labor to equal one talent. And isn't that about what God gives many of us is the, uh, the ability to work at a lifetime and, and the resources to take care of that. And, and we'll think about the two talents or the five talents. This is beyond even a lifetimes of abilities. God is giving them abundant resources. And so we see large amounts that are coming. Now, let's read on, starting in verse 16. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two also. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. And after a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. Well, let, let's go on and, and, and look at this a little bit more here. Basically, from the context of the story, what was the purpose that, that the master had given these resources to his servants? What was expected for them to do? To invest it? To use them on behalf of the estate? To increase the estate, increase the kingdom uh, for the master? To work for the master? Verse 20 goes on. So when he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents, but look, I have gained five more talents beside them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also, who... He also, who received two talents, came and said, Lord, you deliver to me two talents. Look, I have also gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. You know, those words that Jesus shares in this parable are the words that we will long to hear when Jesus comes back. Well done, good and faithful servant. Isn't that our desire as followers of Christ that he will be able to say of our lives, well done, good and faithful servants. We want to be successful at this. And so what is it that he wants us to do? And that is, is he wants us to take the resources that he has given to us and benefit his kingdom, and benefit his estate, to grow his estate. And he will say, well done, good and faithful servants. We see the unfaithful servant. It really wasn't that he didn't honor his, his master. It wasn't that he was trying to mess up. It just simply was this. Then the one in verse 24 
who received one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I weep where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I would have at least received back my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. Those are hard words. What, what really is the story? He's, he's not frustrated because he didn't try. That's the frustration is that he didn't try. It wasn't that he risked. He, God wanted him to risk. I'm saying this wrong. Let me get it out again. Hang on. <laughs> it wasn't. He did nothing. And that was the problem. God wanted him to take a risk with his resources. God wanted him to go out and to try to grow the kingdom. It wasn't his money, the servants, that was at risk. It was rather the masters. And the master said, it was okay to take a risk with the resources that I gave you. But rather, instead, he, he chose to bury them and to take no risk at all. You know, being a follower of Christ is risky business. Did you know that? Have you ever felt that risk? It's risky to, to step out and to talk to somebody else about more than the weather and sports. It's risky to talk to somebody about this wonderful thing, this wonderful person who we know is Jesus and what he has done for us. It's risky, but God wants us to take that risk on his behalf. And by the way, he never calls us to do anything that he doesn't give us the resources to accomplish it. Whatever the calling may be, and not all of us are called to do exactly the same thing, but whatever it is that he has given us resources to do, he invites us, he encourages us to risk it on his kingdom, to risk it on his estate. Verse 29 goes on to say, for to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. The first part of that, though, is interesting. And it says again that if we take a risk, that God will provide even an abundance. Now, where does that come, th come from? Well, from the context of this parable with the one previously, we realize again that this is again our light shining. This is again reaching out and witnessing. And the source of the resource, the, the power to do that, is the Holy Spirit in our lives. If, if we don't get anything else from this sermon today and last week, I hope you'll walk away with this one idea. We need the Holy Spirit to accomplish the work that God wants in our lives. <laughs> Don't walk away from here saying, oh, there's so much to be done and I'm not doing enough. Don't leave here saying, I don't know how I'm going to accomplish this because the task is so big, because it's a big task. He commissioned his disciples, including us, to share the gospel with the entire world. It's an impossible task with the resources that we have. So I don't want you to think about the task. I want you to walk away, and I want myself to walk away with this longing for the Holy Spirit to come into our lives and fill us, because it's when the Holy Spirit comes and that we're filled to overflowing that the task will get done. So long we focused on the, the job and not the resources. And today I want to talk about God has a lot of resources available for us. Don't be afraid to ask for them. Look at Luke 6, verse 38. Luke 6, verse 38. This is an interesting text. Don't be afraid to use your resources, even if they're limited, time, money, influence. Don't be afraid to use your influences on behalf of God's kingdom, because notice this promise. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, 
pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. For the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. This is a fun text to think about. Because God says that the way that we share our resources in the community with others, how we use our time, our, our money, our influence, how we do that, that, the same measure that we use out, he's going to give back to us and then some. Now, I was, Sherry was given some time ago a set of measuring spoons that, frankly, to me, are a bit of a novelty. Because here, here they are. And you're going to need to look very closely to see what these are because um, this one right here, the largest one is a dash, the middle one is a pinch, and the little one is a smidgen. <laughs> so if you've ever seen in a, re a recipe that you're supposed to give a pinch of something, here it is. And I brought them along today because I thought about this verse and I thought about the resources that God gives us and the promise that's here. Now think about it for just a minute. Let's use, oh, the smidgen's just way too small. Let's use a pinch. Now let's say that we take from our limited resources and we're going to take a pinch of that to benefit somebody else. A little bit of time, a little bit of money, whatever that is. Let's say we give a pinch and we share it with somebody else. Here's what this verse says. It says, give and it will be given to you. It's the same measure there at the end. So God's going to bring back. He says, okay, you used a pinch out of your life. He says, I'm going to take that pinch and I'm going to fill it up. I'm going to press it down and it's going to be running over and I'm going to give it back to you. So how much did we get back? A little bit more than we started with, but it's a little bit more than a pinch, right? It's a pinch that's overflowing. Well, let's say we upped it a little bit and went to the dash. Well, this is a little bit bigger. If we would take a dash of our resources and share it with somebody else, God has promised he'll give it back to us, pressed down and running over, and we'll get it back. If that's true, think about what would happen if we used a large measuring device. Let's say we dipped deep into our resources of time and energy and, and, re, uh, and money and those types of things. And let's say we really dug deep and we handed out this large supply of what God has granted to us. It says, according to this word, that he'll use that same measurement and that he'll share it back, pressed down and still running over. We'll get back more blessings than what we've given out. Maybe you've had the opportunity to help somebody. <laughs> Maybe it's unload a U-Haul. Maybe it's something else. Have you ever experienced the joy that happens when you go and give of your time or energies to help somebody else? What does it feel like when you walk away after that day? It feels good, doesn't it? You made a difference. You impacted somebody's life. When they look at a group of people and they say thank you so much for helping me with me with this project whatever it was I don't know how I could have accomplished it without your assistance and and, and you go wow that was wonderful I'm blessed from that am I still on oh, yeah. oh okay I saw you standing up I thought maybe you're okay I thought he was trying to get my attention I'm just blazing on okay <laughs> I do that, you know. <laughs> this is what God wants to do for us. He invites us to dip into our resources that he's given, and he'll give it back. Now, in that same line of thought, look at this last parable, the sheep and the goats. Matthew 25, starting with verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in all his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will set on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And then he says, Why? For I was hungry and you gave me food. 
I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will say, answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. The story goes on that then the goats are addressed. And the goats are, are excluded from the kingdom because God sa uh, Jesus says to them, y you didn't clothe me when I needed to be. You didn't feed me when I needed to be. It you didn't take care of my needs when you were given the opportunity. And they say the same thing as the righteous. When did we see you in those conditions? When did we see you naked, Lord? When did we see you in prison? How did we miss this? And he says the same thing. And as much as you didn't do it to the least of these, my brethren, you didn't do it unto me. What's the difference between the sheep and the goats? That's so important to understand. What I see in this is that the goats are working with their own limited resources. They're doing it the best they can with what they have available in themselves. And they're having to prioritize the things that they do and don't do. They have to be stingy because they only have so much resources in themselves. And so they're holding back. Now, if they had seen Jesus in need, they would have taken care of him. They would have prioritized it because they would have said that was worth an investment of my resources to take care of Jesus in need. But I don't have the resources to take care of all the needs that I run into. There's just not enough of me to go around. And so they've had to prioritize and hold back. And you hear it in the goats' response. Lord, when did we see you like that? I certainly would have taken care of you if I'd seen it. The sheep, on the other hand, are surprised in a different way. You see, the sheep is filled with the Holy Spirit, and it's pouring out of them. It's, it's more than their resources. They can't help themselves. When they find somebody who's in need, the resources from the Holy Spirit pouring out reaches out to them. And it's their habit. It's their practice to reach out to humanity, to, to feed, to clothe. To provide and they're surprised because they say Lord I, I know I took care of a lot of people they were hurt they were in trouble I didn't see you in any of them they, these people were people that others didn't care about I, I didn't see you Lord where were you and Jesus responds when you do it to the least of these my brethren you do it unto me the difference is the amount of resources that were available for the goats, all they had was what they had in themselves. And they had to pick and choose. For those who were the sheep, they had the Holy Spirit flowing out of them like that sink in that mobile home out in Oklahoma. It was more than they could contain and it flowed out and, and they couldn't help themselves because the resources that God provided were so great. There's a little song that the kids sing in Sabbath school and Pathfinders and other places that's called, I Just Want to Be a Sheep. Have you heard that little song? Now, now I hope you, you won't feel too dignified to sing it with me because I'm going to do it up front and I hope you'll join me. It, it's a real simple song though. I just want to be a sheep because that's what I want in my life. I want to be those that are filled with God's resources so much that I can't help myself but to reach out to others. So I hope you sing along with me. I'm not going to get my guitar. We're just going to do this a cappella. And if you know it, kids, I'd invite you to sing along with me. It goes like this. I just want to be a sheep, ba, 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 ba. I just want to be a sheep, ba, 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 ba. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. I just want to be a sheep, ba, 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 ba. That's right. 
And, and I love that song. It's a silly little song that the kids have fun with, and it teaches this lesson about this parable. We want to be God's sheep, relying on him and allowing him to fill us with his resources so that we're overflowing. Luke chapter 11 makes an important promise. Luke chapter 11. Jesus made this promise, and we can hold him to it. He said... In verse 9, So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. And then he gives an illustration of what God wants to do for us. He says, for... Think about it. If a son asks bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? No. Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a snake, a serpent instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? Of course not. If, and then Jesus goes on. If you as humans who are flawed, if you being evil, know how to care for your children and give good gifts, how much more will your heavenly Father give what? The Holy Spirit to those who ask Him. You need to read this text in the full context. This isn't a promise that if you'll ask for a thousand dollars, He will immediately give it to you. Now, He takes care of us. But this is about the Holy Spirit, isn't it? And it says if we will ask, if we will seek, if we will knock, he promises that He will give us the Holy Spirit in our lives. That's all we have to do. And so that's what we need to be doing. Asking and seeking and knocking. And He will give us the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes, it will begin to fill us first. And then it will start to spill over. And it will start to flow out. And we will begin to look like and talk like Jesus to others. And people are going to come up and they're going to say, you're different. Something's different about you. I don't, I don't know how to put my finger on it. And we'll smile inside a little bit and we'll know that it wasn't anything we did, but it was the Holy Spirit in our lives and it's filling us and it's overflowing and we can't help ourselves anymore. The resources that God provides is greater than what we can contain. And I want to encourage you, Pray for that kind of pouring out of the Holy Spirit. I want to close with this benediction that's found in Romans 15, 13. Romans 15, 13. This is what Paul writes. He says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's my prayer for each one of us, including myself. Let's pray for the Holy Spirit and let's let God work through us in our communities. Now, young people, you have done a great job. Thank you for listening so well. And now I'd like to invite our young people to come forward. It's time for our children's story. And Teresa, I think, is going to have our children's story here as we, as we continue on. So young people, come on forward and pick up that offering for the building fund as you come. Church family, may you have a blessed Sabbath. All right. All right. Thank you, guys. <laughs> All right. I laughed. I said, my story is as much for the adults, I think, this morning. It's not really a story. I just want to talk to you guys a little bit about, you know, this time of year, what's a really big thing that everybody kind of gets ready for this time of year? Do you know? What is it, Ryan? Black Friday. Black <laughs> Can somebody take that big kid out of here? <laughs> Not Zach. The grandpa needs out. Um, <laughs> Okay, well, it is going to be Thanksgiving. And what's a really important thing? Grandpa, quit talking to him. 
<laughs> what's, what's something that you think about when you think about Thanksgiving? <laughs> Ryan said turkey, huh? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, people start shopping a way ahead to get ready, get ready for Thanksgiving. It's all about the food. People coming over, going places, maybe going to visit family, and eating. I know in our family, we have company that comes from Chicago. And once they come, about on, sometimes it's Tuesday and sometimes Wednesday, it's sort of just nonstop to the next meal, clear through Saturday night. <laughs> and, um, you know, we enjoy our time together. <laughs> and... Um, we enjoy all that food and everything, and you know, whenever, like if you guys go to the store with your mom and dad, or your grandma and grandpa, whoever you go with, I'm guessing that pretty much when you leave Walmart, your cart is pretty full, and you pretty much have all, any kind of food that you would want to eat when you get home. Um, I don't think any of you came to church hungry, at least if you did, it was probably your own fault because you chose not to eat. Um, but there's a lot of people that don't have enough to eat. And I have a basket up here. And, you know, if I bring, what I brought was peanut butter. And peanut butter's good. I don't know, do you guys all like peanut butter? Yeah? What if that's all you had? Would it be that much fun? Kind of get old, wouldn't it? And it's just not very much. If I was going to give somebody a food basket with this one thing, it's not very much, is it? But maybe I can't afford to give very much. Maybe I can't afford to fill that whole basket by myself. So what do you think the smart thing to do would be? Help. help. To help. You're right. To help and let other people help. And if every, I thought it was so interesting. I'm sitting there listening to Pastor Tony today <laughs> going, okay, he's telling my children's story about helping and about doing our part even if, if it's little or big if I can afford to fill the whole basket that's great but if I can't I can bring one thing and you know we've talked about this here for the last few weeks here at Springtown and we will continue because you know the th you see the food that was out on the tables in the back and actually that room right there is just full of food and Miss Ann and and Miss Noreen have worked very hard to kind of organize it and, and a lot of food baskets are going to go out for Thanksgiving and more for Christmas. I want to tell you a quick quick story this is really probably more for the adults but Noreen has a, a friend um, that she's been helping some with food and some different things and um, she had gone to visit them and take them a food basket and they were just in tears and they told her that they went to, um, I guess, the Mana Center in Siloam this week and to get some food because they were just out. And they waited four hours there. And when they got up finally in line for four hours, when they finally got up to the place, they were told that they were out of food. There's a, there is a big need. I think we forget that so often because, you know, as a rule, we're pretty fat and happy. And, um, you know, we, we do forget that there is a need. And that's why, you know, as a church, we've really tried to, to kind of, you know, push this and have food available, um, you know, here at church. So I have asked some people in the church to show you what it's like when we all pitch in together. When everybody does their little part, then nobody has to do too much. And I've asked them to come up, and we're going to fill this basket, and I'm going to show you what it looks like when everybody does their part then it's easy and we'll have plenty look at all the people and they each are just bringing one Gotta thing See if we can make it stay. Here, we'll put this on the side. <laughs> Here we go. Here, we'll just do this. <laughs> See? 
Now we get sorted again. <laughs> I don't want you guys to look at that basket now. All of those people just brought one item. They brought one thing. And now that basket is full. So if we took that basket to a family that was hungry, there would be enough to feed them for several meals. Don't you think that's really special that if we all do our part that it's easy? All right, let's bow our heads. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for this Sabbath day. Thank you so much for all the many blessings that we've been given. And Jesus, as we look at this basket of food and we realize what a need there is, help us to be generous. Help us to realize that you want us to do our part. And um, you've given us each talents. You've given us each gifts that we can use. And sometimes they're big and sometimes they're small. But if we all put them together, then we can really make a difference in our world. Thank you for your love. Amen.